Hello, everybody. Welcome back to your favourite weekly Leeds United episode. It is the debrief. We're back talking Leeds United. We're back talking all of the things related to this magnificent club after an Easter weekend, which has really tested all of our patience. Leeds United getting a 2 2 draw at Watford. And then last night, in a ridiculous game, an absolutely ridiculous game, testing many more things than just patience. Leeds United got a 3 1 win against Hull City, who came. They saw and they didn't quite conquer, but they were very, very decent. We're going to get into that tonight. Please get your comments in the section below. We'll get, we're going to get into them. We've also put out on YouTube some questions or some uh, a post uh, for you guys to get your questions in for us a lot, and we're going to uh, discuss them tonight as well. But we are joined as well by a special guest tonight, Oliver Ward. Uh, check out his YouTube channel. The link will be in the description below. Ollie's done a fantastic video, which I was involved in, which means it must be fantastic. Uh, but no, only joking. We're going to get into it, everybody. Please slap a like on the video and we'll get the lads involved. We've got Gabe, we've got Ollie, uh, we've got Oscar as well. It's a full house uh, plus one. It's, it's strange to have four on the panel, Gabe. I feel... Since uh, since Brownie, the Brownie days, it's been a, it's just been the, the trio, hasn't it? But how are you doing, mate? You okay? The Brownie days that we every week get reminded of that we can't have him on because he's too busy. It's it's it hurts my heart because there's this conspiracy theory going around that we're just not allowing him on the show. Can I just <laughs> start allowed. by saying we would love to have Brownie here? The man is busy, multiple jobs, coaching, managing. The man is a wanted man. He is, he is. And uh, if you want to check out more Brownie content, you can go on Osset United's YouTube page, <laughs> which me and Gabe have found, and we thoroughly You can enjoy. find a red card if you're really interested in seeing uh, yeah, a Brownie yeah, get yeah. sent off in a match. Uh, I highly it, recommend that. Never mind one Leeds fan channel. Check out Osset, Osset United. It's well <laughs> worth it. Um, I'm going to go to him next, Oscar, because I think he's sweating there because I've not introduced him yet, and it's the first time on the debrief. Ollie Ward, how are you doing, mate? You all good? Yes, I'm all good, thank you. How are well? How's everyone else? Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here on the channel. By the way, mate, it's it's getting you on doing doing the little video we did the other day, which I urge everybody to check out on Ollie's channel. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure, um, and that leads me on to the man who never takes that orange jacket off. I'm convinced <laughs> it is Oscar Marriott. How are you doing, mate? It's great to see. It's great no to see. Was... Believe... Right, no one will believe me. I've actually not worn this orange jacket since the last video. <laughs> that cat, that's rubbish. I actually haven't, honestly. People say that to you, but they, they constantly dig me up for not wearing Leeds United stuff as well. So you can't win, can you? Yeah, but I have to build, boost the quota, the game. I have to wear the club shop to compensate for you and Connor <laughs> never wearing Leeds. <laughs> Well, on, I have, I have, we, we, have, we have we have got we have got the one Leeds merch on. I'm gonna have to send I'm gonna have to send you some of the merch, everyone, and we'll get Oscar in a uh, we'll get Oscar in something different than promoting the club shot. Um, Helen Walker's donated a membership for two months. Shout out All to right, you, Helen. Helen, well yeah. done. Thank you, thank you. Um, but let's get into. Uh, <laughs> I'm saying well done. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, we, we, don't say well done. Ollie, Ollie, you'll, Gabe, Ollie, you'll learn this with Gabe. Anything he says, people can't understand whether or not it's completely sarcastic or not. Nobody. They nobody say Americans can. don't understand sarcasm. This is just my voice. <laughs> <laughs> I should never be a parent. I'll be like, "Good job, son." He'll start crying. <laughs> <laughs> um, I tell you what, there's 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 a lot of comments coming in um, about about obviously the game yesterday, and we're going to get into that right now. I think. Uh, the big. I want to get your takeaways, lads, on 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 the game. We've not really spoken about it. I know there was. <laughs> listen, listen. We've got to be honest, Ollie. We've got a little group chat, and it was it was popping off last night. A few frustrations. So um, we'll go to the level-headed uh, Oscar Marriott to, to take me through a little bit of the game as briefly as you can, mate. Because we've got four members on now, four members who need the voice on this. But uh, yeah, mate, let us know. Let us know what you thought about the game last night. Your frustrations, um, your positives as well uh, regarding these United's win over the whole. Yeah, my head did go a bit last night. I'm not going to lie to you. It's, it's uh, but listen, we got the job done again. It's what we do. We get the job done. We've done it all season. You know, when we've had the really tough moments. And I think this Leeds team, you've got to give it credit. Men mentally, this Leeds team is very difficult to get at. You know, it's very difficult to really beat this Leeds team. Um, and we did it again, didn't we? In, in that kind of sense. And it's the quality players we have in those forward areas that deliver in the key moments. Crescentio, Somerville, does brilliantly to win the penalty, obviously converts the penalty. And that's the big moment in the game, ultimately. And yeah, it wasn't a great game for us in terms of control, in terms of the build-up. We gave the ball away in some really bad positions. We looked a bit awkward yeah, last night, I thought, in terms of when we were trying to pass the ball around. It didn't look very natural. It didn't, wasn't smooth. It wasn't free-flowing. 
It just felt to me the midfield's Gray and Kamara. I just wanted them to switch roles and want Kamara a bit deeper, Gray pushing on a little bit, like he was against Watford. But ultimately, we got the job done. I thought we were excellent in both boxes, and ultimately, we have been excellent in both boxes all season, and that's what's won us the game. We're Hull good last night, absolutely. But did Hull really create enough to say that it was as good a performance as what Liam Brazini was kind of hinting at? I'm not sure. Uh, I, think, I, 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 I think it's somewhere in the middle. I do I know, think I, I, it's somewhere I, in the middle. I, I, I know, but... <laughs> but they didn't create anything, Connor. No, I know. I, I know, but uh, yeah, but a football game I don't think is ultimately all based on XG. I think XG is a, a really good measure of how yeah. dominant you are in a game, of course, but if you're watching that game, I mean, I saw Philogene have some very good efforts last night. I don't know how highly that ranks on the XG um, sort of totem pole, but I, I, I thought... Well, well, why do you say it like that? Yes, you do. No, no. The, the whole point... Of, the, the whole, the <laughs> I see whole what point, you're doing here. <laughs> but, the, the, but the whole point is here, mate. When, when you look at the balance of that game... Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. I think if you're I, Liam, no, I, I, think, I, I think if you're Liam Rossini coming away from last night, you're disappointed in 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 losing the game. Of course, three one. It, it did flatter leads. I thought, and I don't think you can solely personally. I don't think you can solely say. And I know, I know you're not saying this, but I feel you're inferring it a little bit. That if you look at the XG, then then Leeds deserved to win. I thought it was. A, I thought there was a little bit more context there in that game last I night. Think, yeah, there was. But I just think there's two ends of the scale where Leeds did enough to win the game and. Leads were awful. I just think it's somewhere in the middle for me yeah. personally. I think you look at Hull's setup last night, they went with four midfielders, they passed the ball around brilliantly, but they had no end products in the final third. And ultimately, Rosinha got it spot on with the midfield, but they didn't have the end product to capitalize on it. So you've got to look at that side of it as well for me. But yeah, Hull looks good. So there's no Why doubt. Start number that. nine. Why at the start of number nine? You have Billy Sharp on the bench. Crazy. Well, you know, this is the tactical genius Liam Rosinha, Connor, you see. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Um, Ollie, what were your thoughts, mate? Quick shout out to Ethan, who said, who's um, asked where my dad is. Um, my dad's in the bottom corner there. He's just dramatically reduced in age. Uh, no, he's not coming <laughs> on. He's, he might be on next week or the week after. Um, <laughs> Ollie, what were your thoughts, mate? Sure. Did you uh, did you think Lee's deserved it ultimately? Um, I feel like I put the pressure on you there, mate, by just hammering Oscar for an opinion. But what were your thoughts overall? No, nah, the, the <laughs> thing is, I, I thought it was a, um, I thought it was a title winners result. I don't think it was a title winners performance. I think that's quite a good analogy to 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 do it by because Leeds United weren't at their best, but um, good teams find ways to win, as the commentators kept saying last night, and and we did in the end. And uh, it's what the likes of Ipswich and Leicester have done this season. We're not going to be brilliant every game. Uh, and we weren't, we 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 really weren't last night. And I, I think you're right. I think Hull should be, you know, kind of annoyed to come away with with nothing there. Maybe a point apiece could have been a fair result. But at the end of the day, you know, it, it, at this point, I'm not caring about performances. You know, we could win one nil, get dominated all game, as long as we're getting three points on the board. We can't drop points now. So I don't think, as a fan base, you know, we should be worrying about performance, let alone the man of the match results that I'm seeing all over Twitter that people are getting annoyed about. At the end of the day, we've got to go, we've got to win. And what what I saw with um with a few of the players was was a bit of fatigue. I thought the the Easter weekend period kind of was coming into the performance. So this week might be a nice week for them to to relax a bit, get back to training, and hopefully get three more points against Coventry. Yeah, uh, Gabe, you're not a massive fan of, of rotation at this point in the season, which I, I, I completely agree with um, in a sense. But, I mean, last night, did just to Ollie's point, did you think that the, the lads looked a little bit fatigued? I guess you can point to Watford as well. Um, you know, was was been second best for the majority of that game. Are we looking at that as as fatigue or do you think that, you know, maybe Leeds have sort of dropped off a little bit? What are your thoughts? It's hard for me to focus on the topic at hand with that expression plastered to Oscar's face stuck on the screen <laughs> right now. <laughs> but uh, why, did you to, to, why, why did you have to draw attention to it? it could have how can, like, it's a, it's a, we're a live stream. You think people can't see it? We, uh, we it have was, to acknowledge it. <laughs> it, was it was a still, it was fine. <laughs> it's, um, right. So I, I think if it goes beyond fatigue, I think the, the international break was ab about as disastrous as it could possibly be for us. We lost, uh, 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 you know, Connor Roberts, uh, Joe Rodan uh, hurt. He uh, has clearly had difficulties with his back. Uh, apparently, Glenn Kamara was playing with an illness and a fever the entire match, which uh, explains his lethargy. Um, you know, at, at this point, who can we rotate? I mean, we can rotate attacking options. I don't think they have been 
really the problem. I think the issue is, is that, you know, against uh, Watford, obviously, we disrupted that center half partnership, which I understand why Farka did it, but it certainly, um, aside from Pascal Strauch being fit, and uh, I think that's the only scenario where in which I would think about disrupting that partnership of Ampadu and Rodon. Um, and then in this match, Rodon looked a bit off, and it turns out because he was having back spasms. So uh, still to only concede one goal against a very good Hull City uh, team that didn't really have a lot in the way of chance creation, I think was was good. Um, what, one point I was going <laughs> to take up with Oscar was the idea of playing Kamara further, uh, kind of closer to the back back line in a six role. The guy doesn't win any duels. Uh, and 30% of his of his ground duels he won and 0% of his aerial duels. I mean, if you're going to play a more withdrawn six role and really have kind of a one box to box and one uh, like sort of true six, you need to have them be able to, I don't know, make tackles and, and dispossess. And I think this team is really missing uh Gru Gruev right now or missing uh, the Ampadu presence in the midfield that we had when Pascal Strauch was fit so I, that's a concern for me it's more injuries not necessarily rotation um I think we saw when I look at the things in the attacking third the first half wasn't particularly good Crescencio Somerville had an excellent second half though I, I need to point that out um Dan James played better in the second half Jorginho Russo was uh, he continues to be a little bit hot and cold but for me, Pat Bamford missing an open goal chance isn't because he's tired. That's just the chickens coming home to roost after a period of time that we've had a bit of a purple patch with him. <laughs> and it hasn't happened. It's just, it's the player that he is. That's why he needs high volume chances to convert those chances. So if you're looking at rotation, maybe you rotate a, the, the, the starting center forward. Um, obviously, Nanto's been hurt, but right now it's just kind of all hands on deck trying to get through. And I agree with all, what Ollie said. It's a professional result. And, you know, I would have liked to ha have had three points um, away against Watford because I don't think they're particularly good. Um, and I think that's something we could have gotten something from perhaps if if we had tried to maintain some level of, co of consistency. But, you know, the midfield partnership got passed around yesterday and it's not it's easy to point the finger at Glenn Kamara. But I mean, you know, he's he's a metronome player. And Archie Gray is somebody still growing into uh, his identity as a central midfielder. He certainly held up well. But you're not going to win a possession battle with sub 88% pass accuracy, especially if your wingers. I got. I'm going to call out Cree. 96% passing with high volume yesterday. That's fantastic from a winger. Compare that to Dan James at 55. You know, these are. It's the small little things that in a very closely contested match, you know, it's a loose pass here, um, an extra carry there, where you get a tackle, which is what happens to Jorginho quite a bit. All this to say is, I'm I'm with Ollie on this. I. I I'll take these results. Um, we when was the last time we've been beaten? It's it's been a long, long time. And look, we're limping. We're limping towards the finish line. If this if this team can get Connor Roberts back into the team, that will be trim. And it looks like we're going to need to, right? Sam Byron couldn't sprint after halftime yesterday. That's what he said. That's what Daniel Farkas said, at least. So we have some real injury concerns. We we have a lot of depth in the attacking positions. We could rotate there, but given the the lack of cohesion we're going to have with some of the necessary re replacements we've had to call into action in the midfield and in defense. I'm a little bit, I, I I'm sort of like, okay, do we continue to mess with continuity at uh, this late in the season? So high risk, especially when you've again, not lost a match in a long time. I, I sort of don't want to break up that attacking, uh, that attacking group. Yeah. Um, But let me asterisk because I I already I can I can feel that you know what in I'm the, in the I force think, where you're going. I think, I think uh, you know what I'm going to say. Yeah, the asterisk yeah. is if you make any change, that's not Willie Nanto coming back into the team. If, uh, if you make any change to that attacking group, I think you try to start Mateo Joseph over Patrick Bamford. That's what yeah. I would say. I don't think that it's I don't think it's as as easy a decision as people are saying on Twitter. Pat Bamford has played well, but. I think that you're right. We certainly I know. I say you're right, like you've already said it. You said it before. <laughs> we lose something in the press. We have very athletic players in these positions. We don't have it with Bamford. And a number of times yesterday, and I'm not trying to dig out Pat Bamford. He's been fine for us since he's been playing. I'm not. This isn't like last season where you can point to three, four results we lost because he missed chances. But uh, you can see that center half just carrying the ball past him and kind of sojourning into midfield. That was part of the reason they had such dominant possession against us, because it wasn't just the midfield playing it around us. It was the center half just running through. 
uh, engaging our midfield, which makes it difficult on the midfielders who are trying to defend. So um, I, I, I just think I just think when you're looking at it, and I think I, I, I summed it up last night, Ollie. I, I just thought if I'm a defender and Louis Coyle was playing, we, we all know Louis Coyle from his time at Leeds, but right back who, who, who couldn't get in. Um, if I'm Louis Coyle and I'm coming up against a centre forward, there's one centre forward out of those two that I'd prefer to play up against. I think centre backs are terrified of pace. And I think as soon as Joseph came on, he killed Louis Coyle. I mean, Louis Coyle had to go off injured at one point because of a physical altercation with, with Joseph in an aerial battle. I thought he was running him in the channels. Um, he was splitting the left back and the centre back. I thought he was coming deep for the ball. I thought he was going beyond the line as well. He just looks sharper. And I, 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 for me, I don't get it. I don't, and I keep saying on videos, I don't see the downside to starting, uh, to starting Joseph above Bamford. Mm. Uh, and Gabe's mentioned it several times, to be fair, in terms of we well, don't want to break it up. But for me right now, I think he looks a little bit fatigued um, in particular. And I do look at a razor sharp kid who's on the bench, who is now almost doing it for club and country in a sense. And um, I, I, I think I think football should be a meritocracy. I think right now, I think he should be starting for Leeds United. And the worst worst case scenario, you bring Bamford on if Joseph isn't doing it on forty five. No problem with that. And we do what we do with Joseph, but the other way around. I just don't see the downside apart from experience in starting Matteo Joseph now, mate. I don't, I don't know what your thoughts are. I, I completely agree. I, I believe it's it's not the biggest risk in the world. Right. Um, because like you said, we can just do the same thing that we do with him, just bring him on. And, uh, you know, I even put out yesterday that I said how many times, you know, over the last sort of four or five years have we said, God, did you see Bamford's miss? I feel like we have to say that at least once or twice a season and they do become costly. And he was the, you know, he was the luckiest man in Ellen Road last night seeing that his team won because... Look, he, looked looked really, he, looked, he, looked, he looked relieved, didn't he? He looked relieved. And it, it, he's... How many times before has he missed a big chance or missed a penalty that's... Why open in front of the goal as well, Ollie? It's yeah. like, these are the things that as a striker, you, you, you dream about. Like, it's yeah. like a tap-in. Ugh. And I just I don't see the risk in starting Joseph. I think nah. he's done enough when he's come on. Uh, what when he played against Chelsea, I think that's a good enough sort of I don't know sort of showing that he can do it. And yeah, I, I completely agree. When you look at Bamford, sometimes it looks like he's he's running in treacle. You know, I I feel like he's just so sort. I feel like he's slow, and sometimes I I don't think he really. He's not quick enough for me that he understands the the movement sometimes of Somerville and Rutter and things like that. Sometimes I do think he's a he's a step behind sometimes, and I think the pace of Matteo Joseph might help the the, the front few of, uh, a bit more. I don't know if that's if that's right in saying, but sometimes I just see Bamford, and I sometimes just I I just I don't know. I I just don't at the moment feel like when he's not scoring goals, he's he's not doing enough for me. I think the only counterpoint I would have to that, and you hear the players talk about this as well when they ask about players that don't get enough credit in the side, they do talk about Patrick Bamford with some of the subtle off-the-ball movement, mm. just in terms of creating vital pockets of space that create those lanes for Jorginho to run into and create problems for the defense. I think especially given that you have a player like Somerville, which at periods of time was all the way on the right side while Dan James was there arguing over who's going to take a throw. Mm. You're sort of like, get <laughs> get back to, to your side of the pitch you do need players with some positional discipline as well who i'm not saying joseph doesn't have that i'm just the the devil's advocate argument yeah. is that with younger players you're going to have less discipline right and i think that you already have a player in dan james on, out on the pitch that is a kind of point and click run as fast as you can type of guy somerville who's a little bit unpredictable and just does what he wants which we we do better that way Mm -hmm. um, but Jorginho, who's a little bit wheel and deal, very inconsistent, kind of minute to minute. Sometimes he's brilliant. Sometimes you're you're scratching your uh, scratching your eyeballs out. And then you know, um, it, so it's really hard to hard to say. But I'm sort of with the group here that I don't think that you take a huge risk if it doesn't work. You can bring on Patrick Bamford at halftime. Mm -hmm. But he does pose the the one thing I will say that again at the end of the season that you do lose by putting uh, Matteo Joseph in, I mean, not having Dan James be able to come off the bench because of Nanto's injury. I've said it before, as a center half, I've just played 65 minutes. It's the end of the season. We're banged up. We're tired. And now I have to see Dan James come on. I'm thinking, great. 
Same thing with Mateo Joseph, a kid who's going to run me ragged. It's different if I see Patrick Bamford come on. I'm like, all right, I'll just use my last ounce of strength to push him around and you know. But I think I think I'd really enjoy getting that game sorted and wrapped up in the first 60, 65 minutes with someone like Matty or Joseph on the pitch, to be honest with you. Saying that, a lot though, Connor, because we don't we don't have a lot of evidence that that can happen. And that, that's what I'm saying. So like you don't know. And as you said, and I agree, I don't want to be I'm not trying to be argumentative just for the sake of it, but you're right. I don't think we we risk a lot. But what you do take out of your your arsenal is game changing substitutions. If you need a game change, if for whatever reason it doesn't work, if they execute a really good tactical plan and the young players aren't able to break down a low block, what are you going to bring in Patrick Bamford to break down the low block? Sixty fifth minute? No, it's better to bring on some fast players who can uh, give the def defense new things to think about. So that's the, that's the sometimes it's just about timing. But I do agree, macro point that for me. I would like to see Mateo Joseph given more time, but you know, I, do we think that Farka will do it? I don't think it's very likely. Mr. Marriott, I think you've had 0. 0.2 seconds speaking on this podcast for your own, for, because of your own fault, mate, but go on. Yeah, I think I'm with Gabe here. I think the best call for the time being is Bamford start, Joseph come on. I think what I'll say is, I do think moving forward, I think Mateo Joseph is outstanding. You can't really yeah. ask for much oh, yeah. more from an up-and-coming striker. You don't see especially at this level, many strikers come through the academy and make an impact at this level. It's just a very difficult league, very physical. And Matteo Joseph's up for it every single time. Yep. But what I will say is this is happening when he's coming off the bench. Listen, you have the, obviously the game against Chelsea where he's outstanding for 90 minutes. It's definitely a case for it. But for me, I think Joseph off the bench is a better prospect than Bamford off the bench, if that makes yep. sense. I still think keep Joseph hungry. Yeah, you know, I think it, it is the Bamford versus and Ke Kessia kind of situation for 2019, 2020 all over again. But for me, I think I'm sticking with Bamford for the time being, but definitely another one or two bad games from Bamford. And I think Joseph will probably get the nods. But ultimately, it's very disappointing from Perot's point of view that he's not even in this conversation. And mm. listen, I think he is more of a 10 than a centre forward, but he's not going to play as 10 in this team. He's no, he won't. But he played well, didn't he, Oscar? He, he played well coming on. I thought I thought Piro did well. I thought he was, yeah, well. thought he was okay coming on. Um, but you still need more from Piro for me, ultimately. Yeah. You know, said, really, it, said, said, said it for three, four To really make the case yeah. for this team. Yeah, this not really enough. should be the opportunity for Piro now. Coming into the back end of the season... But he's nowhere near it at this moment in time and says they're starting 11. But well, especially, especially, especially when you are seeing Joseph coming on doing what he's doing. And, and yeah. you know, I can't imagine there's that many minutes between them in terms of when they've come on and as uh, substitutes, because there was a point really when Joseph didn't come on at all. But um, you're seeing a massive impact pretty much every single time. I mean, even last night. He was an absolute, it was, it was a nightmare. As soon as he came on for Hull City's back line, I felt they dropped about two or three yards deeper. They were wary of him. He dropped deep. He'd go beyond that line, as I keep saying. And and he just with Perot, when he comes on, I just, I'm like, yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, Perot's coming on. And I'm just a bit, I need, I think we all need a little bit more from him at the minute. And to be fair to him, what I will say is, uh, yeah, I kind of want to get into this in a, in a funny sort of way. What did you make of the... Um, the penalty thing that could have gone very, very, very wrong, couldn't it? Well, apparently, I, I've seen reports that Farka apparently overruled and said uh, and, and indicated that it was going to be Somerville. So I think that's where some of the adamant behavior from Somerville came from. I but, think I think Farka was trying to save himself when he said that personally. Maybe. In, yeah, in the interview, yeah. kind of but, but and... if we do this thing where we second we, we think the then I'm going to question everything the manager yeah, says, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which I did earlier in the season anyway. So, <laughs> but this kind of thing has been going on for years after years after years. It doesn't not just Leeds United; it happens with every single club at some point. It doesn't matter who the des designated penalty taker is; it happens at some point in the season. Mm -hmm. And the main thing is, Somerville scored it. You know, it's not like Bamford at Stoke mm -hmm. away. You know, earlier in the season, the narrative's totally different. You know, if Bamford has scored that, Somerville had missed. We all know the narrative would have been totally different, but that's it's the nature of football. It's just one of those things. But you know, I think obviously I probably would have wanted Perot to take it in all honesty, because obviously he still remember some. I didn't think it was a great penalty by Cree, did you? No. No, it wasn't I, great. Was long, I think he's so. lucky to score. I was like, Whoa, I think Perot's our best striker of the ball. I will say that much. You know, for all the critics of Perot, there's no doubt about it, he can finish. Yeah, yeah. there's no penalty question he gets a chance. He can finish. He is ruthless to that left foot and Penalty wise, this season when he's took them, they've been pretty uh, emphatic, kind of thing. So I do think when we get another penalty, 
I say when, not if, by the way. <laughs> Perot will take it, I think. What I kind of like as well, though, is that we had two players arguing whoever wanted to take it instead of going, oh, no, you have it. No, you have it. They were both <laughs> like, no, I'm taking this. And uh, yeah, like, but the thing is, what I didn't get was the whole thing that Farker said about Somerville taking it is because he actually brought on Perot was it against Preston and he took the penalty then and he said, I wouldn't allow a player to come. He kind of just sort of went against his yeah. word a bit last night. But at the end of the day, like you said, ball's in the back of the net. Three points is there. So is what it is. Yeah, uh, Mucker North has just become a new member. Phil says, uh, lead success has been built on partnership. Uh, Glenn and Gray never played CM before as a pair. Leads have the individual quality yeah. over to win games. Yeah, I think it's that's the thing. And it you're playing two individuals there who, who, who like to get forward, really. And, and, and you're sort of requiring one to almost play a six role in a double pivot. And I think... It is really hard. And there's an argument that Ampadu, you know, wants to get a, a bit further forward than the likes of Grueb. Grueb, I think, is just that solid number six. He doesn't mind. I think Ampadu, you see him sometimes marauding forward a little bit and you can mm -hmm. see he likes getting forward. I think Grueb is literally the only player in the squad who is that standard number six, really. So, yeah, yeah I can understand how the, the balance was affected a little bit. But um, I thought... Especially with I, illness, too. I, I mean, so... I feel bad. Can we Go say on. this for most teams, though, this season? Yeah, obviously, we saw Leicester with Pereira out for Bristol City. They had Chowdhury yeah. at right back, and they looked mm -hmm. a mess playing out the back. You know, I think Gruev, I think, has been a big loss for us. There's no question about it. I think as soon as you get Gruev back in, you've then got Kamara or Gray in more suited roles to them, a little bit higher up the pitch in between the lines. I, I think it looks a lot better. I, I don't think there's any issue with us tactically. I just think we're missing some key profiles in key areas, and Gruev is definitely... Let's not forget... This whole run started with Gruev coming into the team. So we can't act like Gruev hasn't been yeah. a big player for this team. And, and it's not yeah. deflecting. It, it is just a fact. You've seen it with Southampton when they've had key profiles missing. Leicester, and to a, a lesser extent, Ipswich, you have seen it with the other teams as well. When they have key players missing, they have looked disjointed. And I think this is just a point in the season where we've got some key profiles missing. And yeah. that's been the case for us, really. Do you think? Do you think last night I, I sort of mentioned this on the video, and, it, and it's open for discussion? And I'm I'm really interested to hear sort of the chat and and where you guys, you know, because we like to talk about it being quite tactical on this channel as well. And and I, I do I do look at the game last night, and I look at Tyler Morton, I look at Seri, I look at their midfield, and I thought they were brilliant um, in terms of that press. Um, I wonder because of the style of player that Gruever is, how he'd have alleviated any pressure last night because I feel like with Gruev he's a tidy player he's almost like a, obviously he's a better Adam Forshaw but he's that similar profile I feel and I feel last night Melier was the spare man every single time I felt when Leeds were pressed it was straight back to Melier Leeds were pressed straight back to Melier or it was lateral or, or backwards you know to the to the you know the, the fullbacks the centre-backs or, 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 or Elan I don't understand where what Gruev does in that lineup to then alleviate any of that? Is it is it Kamara gets a little bit further forward and and all that sort of stuff? I'm not really sure because Grove isn't a player who picks out a forward pass. He just isn't. So I don't, I don't understand how he'd have helped that, to be honest with you. I, I think well, that say, is... Sorry, I, I think No, sorry. I think that it's more of Grove is positionally better than both of those two in the six. I think that he disrupts more attacks. If you look at just in terms of the interceptions and the duels won, it was significantly... Uh, less and it has been since grub has been out of the team well, about, a lot of that, I'm, 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 I'm about to get up. to your build up but yeah, yeah, build yeah. up build up happens um, primarily where you get the ball so if you're dispossessing the opposing side in contested areas in the center of the park it's easy to play a lateral pass out to a wing, out to a winger or an attacking fullback if you're only relying on trying to pack people uh, your players behind the ball while they play the ball left to right, left to right, which is what Hull was doing because we didn't have a lot of, and again, this isn't insulting the guys who were filling in, but we just didn't have a lot of awareness defensively in terms of how to disrupt their possession. We couldn't then spring players who were ready to run or run in behind them. So a lot of the way we build up, we don't just play it around a melier and then they make an incisive long diagonal a lot of the time. A lot of the time we dispossess a side more towards the, the, the center of the park and then spring our players wide and fast and, and get into um, to the open spaces. That's a lot of how we build up. It's not just kind of... Pedro Melier doesn't have the pass completion rate 
to just play through him. He doesn't. Long balls, he was 24% yesterday, 70% on the short passes. That's not criticism of Melia. It's just the fact we don't build around Elon Melia most of the time. We build around getting the ball back quickly and then starting our own kind of possession, um, kind of metronome uh, is sort of the way we do. So uh, yeah, do, do I think it would, would have been better, obviously, if we had Pascal Strauch in and we saw Ethan Ampadu with one of those two guys? Yeah, obviously, he can play passes that... Um, that I think Kruev can't play. I think the big difference is the way we've been able to control matches and create goal-scoring opportunities is he's done just the grunt work in terms of being in the right spot, breaking up attack, and then starting our movements further up the pitch than we were doing last night. We were When Hull had the ball, we were pinned into our own area. We weren't playing 10 in the box. That's not what we were doing. But we just didn't have that wherewithal to disrupt their attack earlier. And you can tell. Uh, you could tell that just when we were able to spring, when we did get the ball, the anticipation of us getting the ball, it just wasn't there. It just a lot of our attacking patterns of movement were, were messed up because we didn't have one of those, at least one of those guys pre like as a predator in those passing zones, you know? So it does make a huge difference kind of where you start your movement. I think the thing as well is Gruev is, is the metronome, isn't he, in that midfield? He never gives the ball away. Like he, he literally... Never metronome me metronome bingo. <laughs> <laughs> what? He never gives the ball away. That's the thing with Grev. You know, consistently, you know, I'm, I'm doing a game here. I'm quoting some Grev stats. I mean, his pass completion, it never drops below 90. It does, but it very rarely drops below 90. You know, he, he is ridiculously efficient on the ball. I do take Connor's point in terms of he's not the most progressive midfielder in the league in that kind of sense. He's not, no. you know, say a Dewsbury Hall or an Ndidi you know, type of midfielder in that sense. But I think the way we use our midfielders, I don't think we really use them for that. I think we use our, we try and progress the ball through Rutter and Somerville. We try and get the ball into them yep. as quickly as possible. You know, in, yep. you know, sometimes Rutter and Somerville, often Rutter picks the ball up in our half of the pitch, which is like you're thinking, our number 10 is picking the ball up on the edge of our own day kind of thing. But that is, that's just how we play, and it's worked for us this season. So it doesn't concern me too much in that sense about Gruev, but I do think what the difference would have been last night is you'd have had Gruev in a comfortable position. You know, I don't think Archie Gray, who looks the most deep of the two, I don't think he's as comfortable doing that in terms of picking the ball up off the back four as what Gruev is. I think Gruev is just so good at it. Yes, he's yeah. very left-footed, but he can get... He can, buy himself angles and time and, you know, get into the right positions to, you know, to receive the ball and, you know, give, give and go kind of thing and get us out of a high press and that lot. I just think Archie Gray is better either, you know, a right back overlapping or a little bit of ahead of Gruev or Ampadu in that midfield. I just think he's better. There's more of a box to box, you know, not, that's just not the type of player Archie Gray is. He's not a Gruev type of player, which is what we were kind of asking him to do last night. And I think is what, caused a lot of the disjointedness with Leeds last night. Um, I was a little bit disappointed with Kamara. I thought Kamara could have stepped up a little bit more. I think his form hasn't been great last couple of weeks, but I do think Gruev ultimately, Gruev and Ampadu were the best suited to playing like as the sixes or the deepest midfielders yeah. in this team. Yeah, I think Ampadu off the ball, but Gruev on the ball, I think is really suited to that role. And I just think as a team, I think Gruev alone improves us a lot. Not just because, not because Gruev's this 10 out of 10, outstanding midfielder just because of the balance he gives us in that midfield yeah uh phil said byron did a job on philogy and i feared him kick off yeah i think byron did a good job ollie um thought he was defensively sound 1v1 battles we've seen a couple of um of, of dicey moments for for archie gray this season some successes obviously but a couple of dicey moments it's in it's interesting when you look at the individual battles that we've seen this 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 year you know uh, johnny rowe morgan whittaker um, Mavadidi, obviously, and and it was another one last night that I think, you know, if you know what Philogene's about, you were a little bit worried, and you saw him throughout the game. He was very, very good, wasn't he? And 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 just talk talk to me a little bit about uh, Byron's performance last night, mate. Yeah, I, I thought it, I thought it was very good, but one thing I did question uh, during the game was how much he steps off philogene he doesn't go straight into it. He actually allows philogene to move closer and closer into the box, which actually I thought caused a few problems with Leeds uh, last night, really. But when they were just one-on-one -on -one close, Barham always stuck that foot and he won it. But actually, if you watch the counter-attack, Barham's always stepping back. And sometimes 
you know, sometimes it's helpful, but sometimes you're actually pushing it back further and further and further. And then I know Felagine had a few efforts where he, he wasn't too far away. So I think, you know, overall, Byram had a very good defensive display last night and, you know, coming in at right back where he's played left back. And we knew we couldn't go with the same back four that played against Watford. I think, you know, credit to Coops, but it's not, this isn't the time you you start playing Liam Cooper personally. And Byram done a good job at right back because we were worried about that Philogene. I know I was before before kickoff, but yeah, overall we had a good game. But sometimes if you do watch him, it's the actual complete opposite to Furpo, where Furpo actually gets too close, tries to chuck in a weird leg and gets done sometimes. <laughs> yeah, that's and, true. Uh, it's, if you watch Sam Byram last night, sometimes a few efforts came from Philogene because he stood off him too much. But overall, I thought Byram had a very good game. Yeah, I, I agree. I thought that the start of the game, his positioning was very off. Um, and I thought he really had to get to grips with it for the first 10, 15 minutes. Um, I don't know. It just, to me, to me, to be honest, lads, it just doesn't feel, and I didn't ever think I'd be saying this, but without Archie being there, you do feel at right back, that is, you do feel like the option is sort of a significant step off, really. And or Connor Roberts. Like, I mean, he's hurt too. And I think we would have yeah. felt much better if he was in there. Yet you sign a player like Sam Byram on a free, not because everyone thinks he's a top four side in the championship starting uh, right or left back. You know, I think that he did the job he was asked to do, and he, I think he did it well. I mean, he, he got us a goal as well, which is really, really solid uh, and a little bit unexpected. But I, I think we can all agree he looks better on the right than he does on the left. He's not a nat, nat, uh, natural left-footed player. Um, but for, for us right now, and I'm really concerned because – I'm not sure how long Connor Roberts is hurt. Um, I don't know if Byram can play another match in a row. Uh, he has a horrible fitness track record anyway, but apparently he couldn't. Again, I, I hope Farka was just kidding, but apparently he said he couldn't run after after halftime um, or couldn't sprint. Um, so yeah, I think that <laughs> we could be a little, little bit of trouble injury wise. So I was just happy to get out of to get out of there with a good result. Really, I think Byram has been. Very solid, you know, in terms yeah. of over the season. I don't think he's been, listen, he's not been the best fullback in the league or anything like that. But in terms of what we've, you know, we've bought him for nothing, I think he's been as solid as what he was in the yeah. first spell. I think, in anything, I think he's been defensively better than he was in the first spell. And he's done what we need, really. And I think if he plays against Coventry, he's a solid option to have. But I would prefer to have Roberts, of course, but he's a solid option to have. Yeah. You know, I don't want to do that thing where we, you know, this is not about piling on the old guard, but imagine if we had still had Luke Ailing and he was starting in a right back right now, I'd be freaked out. Uh, and that's where we were uh, at, at various points in the past. So uh, I think that it's a lot more stable of an environment, but you know, it, it's going to be a, a tense run towards the end of the season because we have to continue to win because Ipswich, for whatever reason, I don't know what burial ground they unearthed to give them secret powers for the end of the season. I want to know, I want to know whose soul they sold to get to get to where they're, they're at. But um, we keep saying, because the underlying data and just reason tells you that they can't keep doing this and winning these last gasp math matches that they've been thoroughly outplayed throughout him, but they keep doing it. Damn it. They yeah. keep doing it. I don't know how it's possible. Yeah, they, they they do, and and you know that was going to be the next. There's there's been, I asked you guys to comment on the on on the, uh, the YouTube tab. I asked you for some questions in for this episode as well, um, and and that was a, a theme throughout. Really, it's the promotion race. It's the Easter discussion now. I did say, and I will say, and I told you so for the first time, one of the first times. I'm I'm, I'm giving myself a bit of credit there, but I did think that one team would fall off this weekend, and I think we have now got a complete fall off from Southampton a complete and utter bottle job. But what I will say is James Breeden sent off in that game was nothing short of another EFL horror show when it comes to the decision. <laughs> and, uh, it, it? And, and then as soon as you saw him sent off, Ipswich fans get it, get, got on top a little bit. A goal came from Broadhead again. And you thought, I mean, I put it out on Twitter, 10 minutes before the goal went in, I, you know the script, you know exactly what's going to happen. Ball bouncing in the box, Leif Davis involved again. <laughs> And just a swipe from uh, Sami Enzo, who's been an inspired signing for Ipswich from Brighton. And Oscar, they are not going away, are they? And they are just becoming more and more and more of a problem. Absolutely. Guys, is this is this monsoon that's happening behind me, picking up on the mic? <laughs> no. <laughs> Honestly, out of, you will out not of believe con out of how much rain out, is, out, is occurring. Can we, can we, can, can we, right, just, right just, now, just, honestly, guys. 
Get, um, Gabe, Gabe, quick anyway, one before you anyway, start, Oscar. Switched, quick, no, they're not going away, guys. We need to make pay. Oscar, wait. Oscar, wait. <laughs> I, was, I was just... <laughs> Oscar, I don't think you could hear me then. Um, <laughs> and, and I've completely lost my thread of thought, to be honest. But I was, I was hoping that one leads uh, out of context on Twitter me and Gabe, we're going to be able to find the guy who actually does that or the girl who does that. And some of these moments, Oscar, that you're providing on, on the debrief are, are out of context and fantastic. We need this guy back on it. That's all. Have you got a bucket hat that you can put on and it, it look great with the rain in the back? <laughs> all right, sorry, unpause. Go ahead. <laughs> go on, mate, go on. Do you want to talk about Ipswich? Yeah, go on. How inevitable they are. Yeah, go on. Just not inevitable. Away, are you doing the full Thanos? You think Ipswich is Thanos, Thanos now? This is the... You need to bring the meme back, me doing that Thanos meme. Do you remember that? A couple of weeks yes. ago. <laughs> I created that meme. What do you mean, do I remember that? <laughs> I, did, I, I hang on a second. It wasn't you who created it. Yes, it was. Uh, I commissioned. It was I commissioned and paid someone. I said, make this and I'll send you 15 quid. See, I didn't know that. I thought someone had made that out of love. Oscar, no, Oscar, no, Oscar, 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 do me, a, do, do me a solid and for God's sake, talk about Ipswich. Right, Ipswich. <laughs> I'm going to interrupt right. again. Ipswich, okay. Rain's finally died off anyway. <laughs> right, Ipswich. <laughs> Say Ipswich one more time. Now. Go on, do it again. Right, Who are we talking about? They're not going away, lads. They're not going away at all. Um, their experience from last season, it's showing at this point in the season now, you know, in terms of the last minute winners. That Blackburn one was a big one. I don't know how they got away with that one. Um, they did big time. It's just a really well drilled team. The options off the bench as well, you know, in terms of rotation. I think Ipswich is a controversial one, this. I think they're worrying me more than Leicester at this moment in time. I think Leicester feel more likely to drop points. I think Leicester mm -hmm. have shown a little bit more vulnerability, both systematically in terms of that Bristol City game causing their own problems. And and in terms of experience, I just think this Ipswich team just got that nice balance of youth and experience. And obviously, Leif Davis is a cheat code at this moment in time. 16 assists, I think. Well, that defensively, he's not. He's Listen, you have to give credit where it's due. That is absolutely insane from left back. 16 yeah. assists, and the season's not even finished yet. He could he could hit 20 assists this season, which is a cheat code. Um, the scary thing as well is Hutchinson is getting better and better. Broadhead's not even in the team at this moment in time. El Amadi's obviously grown into it. Uh, Kiefer Moore is, I think he's actually injured at this moment in time. Yeah, isn't he? I believe. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. he's still to come back. So I actually really do think Ipswich... They, they feel like five or six wins out of six, to be honest with you. At this moment. I, know, I, I think Leicester I, I, are the ones I look at. Yeah, and think. Yeah. I still think we can get top two, don't get me wrong, but I think Ipswich, they, yeah, they can mix it I, up. They can absolutely decimate teams like they did against Sheffield Wednesday and they can find a way to win the scrappy ones as well. You know, if it's a 1-0 hanging on for 90 minutes or if it's finding a way to come back from 2-1 down. I don't know if you're glad to watch the Samson game, but Samson were fantastic last night. Mm. It was, yeah, they were good very good. It was very similar to the Leads against Hull, really, in terms of the bounce of the game. If anything, Samson probably more dominant. You know, they're creating clear cut chances. Adam Armstrong has had a lot of chances in that game to to bury Ipswich. And some will say the underlying data, Gabe. Um, <laughs> it's like I invented like, data. You also get into data, Oscar. I knew you get a reaction. I knew you get a reaction. demonized me in this whole. I'm the only one. No, the Americans invented but data. No, Jesse Marsh today. invented XG. You look at it and you say, surely at some point in these six games, it's what you're going to get found out. But it just doesn't feel like it's going to happen. They feel like Chris Wilder, Sheffield United in 2019. They are just not going to go away, lads. I'm sorry. They're not going to go away. You've got to make peace. Connor, right now. did you ever think, given the amount of stick we gave both these guys before the season, which we both look a little bit silly now because they both had great years, but did you ever think that Josh Sargent and Haji Wright could be the great hope to sink Ipswich over. I wondered, I wondered, I wondered how, how long has it taken as 45.09 for American <laughs> players to be brought into it. Yeah, Listen, no, I, didn't, I didn't ever think of Hadji Wright at the start of the season. Man. No, I didn't neither did I. He's got like, what, 14 goals and six assists or something stupid like that? Yeah. Josh Sargent has like 13 or 14 goals and like you know, 19 you know, matches. You know, you know exactly how many goals and assists. I don't. I know that don't meme know. on on Twitter. The uh, get in get in there and make it about a, the US men's national team. That's what Gabe's doing right now. <laughs> I'll bring up Tyler Adams again if you let me. Um, no, I'm just kidding. No, but no, it's relevant, right? They, they have they have Norwich coming up. That they're a team that is not bad and that can be dangerous. The thing is with Norwich, they're just strange, aren't they? Sometimes they play really well under David Wagner, and then other times, who is also an American, David Wagner. Just a little connection there. Um, if Bamford was was American, listen, I 
I don't have any American flags in this flat, but I might set them on fire if that was the case. Um, it's very intense. Um, anyway, point being, it's a run of games that I think both Coventry, I mean, we have to play Coventry, don't we? So we'll see how that goes. But Coventry and Norwich, of the teams in there, I think Middlesbrough, you can't cast aside, but Ipswich have challenging fixtures. But at this point, just the romance of it, the, the sentimental side of me, which is like a small millimeter of a kernel size in my heart that may not even work wants them to continue to because it creates just a dramatic end of the season and i you like the, the pressure the, that we're under you can't beat the script writers unfortunately and the script writers have written it dips which double yeah. promotion you know it, it just honestly it just you look at like the blackburn disallowed goals you're thinking how like the first one where it's like offside you're thinking how, how but it's like even james, it's like it's like saving like james the james Bree sending off it's just yeah, yeah. you think it's yeah. just the footballing gods working isn't it it's ridiculous it's like um, davis finds an mbappe like pace to get in behind james Bree. you're thinking <laughs> what is going on here what is going on here kind of thing it's um but yeah the norwich game though i, I I think if Ipswich are going to drop points, I've got a feeling it's going to be that Norwich game because it's going to have Norwich to be, mate. It's going to have to be. Would rather miss out on the top six mm. and stop Ipswich going up than make the top six themselves. Honestly, Norwich. What? <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. I might be exactly. What would you mean hundred percent? I cannot tell you how motivated Norwich will be to stop it. Which honestly, that is a. I would say Gabe, 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 you've got you've got you've got a guy in the top right who lives there, so I'm trusting what. No, no, hang on. Help me understand what Oscar just said. They, they would rather stop Ipswich from going up than get into the playoffs themselves. Yeah, I, I honestly do. I reckon if you offered Norwich fans the choice, <laughs> the bracket might be insane. To be fair, if you stop, you know like, these fan bases more than me. I'm just saying that I'll I'll never. I'll never understand. I'll never it's understand. Like, You'd rather your enemy fail than you succeed. I just... What is it? Wow. Like the Everton-Liverpool rivalry, which I do kind of gather it is a little bit like that between Norwich and the Ipswich. They, I honestly do think Norwich would take that if, if they stop Ipswich going up. What's the, Ollie, what's the, what's the, what's the, um, what's your, what's your obviously thought on it as well, mate? I mean, Ipswich now, obviously you living, living down there at the, you know, the finger on the pulse. Um, I know you know some Ipswich town fan create content creators as well. And um, what, I mean, what, what's the feeling sort of down there? Is there a, I mean, are they all sort of like buoyed and confident right now or, or are they sort of thinking to themselves it's going to drop off and Leeds are going to steam throw, steamroll through with Leicester? I think it's the thing. A lot of my mates support Ipswich, and like you said, I know a lot of content creators who are Ipswich fans as well. Um, I think it's a thing where they're still just sort of counting their luck. They're saying this is a brilliant ride, and hopefully it doesn't stop. And they don't see why it's going to stop. I think throughout the whole season, they've they've said, like most teams and most you know fans have said, this will stop soon. You know, we'll lose next week. We can't keep winning like this. And literally, my mate sent me a video yesterday. He said, we can't keep winning like this, but we do. So, you know that. I would love to give them all the respect, but we're in the same race as them. So, you know, yeah. I, I don't want to. Um, but I completely agree with what Oscar said. I, I would, I do think that Norwich would rather stop Ipswich going up than getting top six themselves. It's pathetic, I know. isn't it? Yeah, exactly. It's, and it's my coping mechanism, that, Ollie. That's my yeah. coping mechanism going into Saturday. That game is Norwich's playoff final. Well, the they have is, to. They have to. They, they have to drop points there. They have yeah. to. We need something. We need something from another side against Ip, yeah. Ipswich right now. The something thing has is, to give. Ipswich haven't beaten Norwich since something like 2009, 2010. I believe yeah, it's, 15 it's, years, it's, it's, it's 15 a mad years. thing like that. Yeah. So, and it would be, like you said, the script right is that they beat Norwich for the first time in 15 years and get back to the Premier League while winning the title. I could just see it, unfortunately. Um, but is, yeah. Ollie, so you, you live in Norwich, you said? No, nah, Ipswich. Oh, Ipswich. All right, never mind. I was going to ask if Norwich is a good night out. I know the answer to that. It is. <laughs> it is a good night. Here we go. No. <laughs> Another English town review. Um, I can safely say I've never been on a night out in Norwich, but I'm going to go with it's not a good night out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I feel that as well. I feel like yeah, I nothing imagine. wrong with Norwich, nothing wrong with Norwich, but I don't get the vibe that it's a good night out. Yeah, yeah, I've done. Yeah, I've been Spent to. Drunk. Have you heard? Have you heard of Backton, Alex? <laughs> Backton. No, okay. It was just a backwards place I went in East Anglia. That was it, mate. That's oh, the... Backton. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I know Backton. Yeah, yeah. Mate, mate. I, I, it was like the Wild <laughs> West. It was like the Wild West. It was just a garage and, and like a hotel. I was like, what's going I on? I almost look forward to our conversations of slagging off English towns we don't <laughs> no, love. No, more no, than no, talking about the football. We, 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 have a lot of, we have a lot of Leeds fans down there. I know we do, like in East Anglia. And it was just, it was, it was crazy. It was just like, uh, it, it was like looking... 
into just the, the deep south in America. Yeah. Um, that, which is a terrible place to be. Which is worse, Connor, that or Hull on a night out? Oh, good Lord. Um, <laughs> I didn't go on a night out in East Anglia, to be fair, but Hull is... Hull, Hull's, uh, sorry if we've got some Hull Leeds fans here. But, uh, <laughs> I don't Hull's, care. Hull, Hull is... Paul's <laughs> interesting. I'll put it that way. Um, Bend it. Yeah. Country. Anyway. Anyway. Uh, so the, the the what I wanted to get onto as well, lads, and everybody in the comment section as well. There was a there was a, a big consensus on the questions back. Um, some guy asked me, "What's your favourite fast food restaurant, Connor?" Um, I I don't know, mate. Uh, I I really don't know. I, I, my fast food of choice is fish and chips. So I, yeah, I mean that's that's. I would have thought you were a Nando's guy. No, no, no. <laughs> them prices. Yeah, what? Well, Nando, mate, prices. Have you seen fish and chips now? It? Sorry, Ollie, this is not the content you came. Let's welcome Ollie to the channel and ask him what his favorite night out is <laughs> and fast food joint. Yeah. I'm loving it. That's brilliant, Gabe, Gabe. You, Gabe. By the way, by the way, for what? the first time, for the first time ever, for the person who's got the absolute perfect conditions on his side. You've been asked to turn your audio down, and I can hear it. Yeah, Andy of Raw, I could care less what Andy's asking me to do. <laughs> well, well, can, well, can you turn it down a slight bit? Yeah, sure. Um, so <laughs> Calvin, I'll do it for you. Thanks, mate. <laughs> Calvin Phillips has been uh, pretty much the theme of the question, really, uh, the theme of the, a lot of the questions and and discussion on, on Calvin Phillips, uh, potentially coming back to Leeds, if we did get to the Premier League. So I'm going to open the floor a little bit. Um, and I'm really interested in what everybody thinks on this because I kind of want to put a lid on it because I'm so sick of talking about this. But listen, it keeps getting brought up, so it's clearly an, a, of interest. Um, Ollie, uh, what, what's your thoughts, mate, when it comes to uh, Calvin Phillips? Would you would you welcome him back at, at Ellen Road next year if we were to get promoted, or or is it not of interest to you? Calvin Phillips is my is my favourite footballer, and I love him for everything that he's done at Leeds United and. I always want him to do well, whatever club he's at, at City, at West Ham, wanted it to go well. Um, obviously, if he did come back, I'm not saying that's happened, but if he did, of course, we'd all welcome him again. Do you know what I mean? Um, but I think it's a thing where, as much as it pains me to it, because I do love Calvin, I think we just got we just have to move on a bit. You know, we do. And there's no doubt there that there's an absolutely brilliant player. And a lot of people are saying, you know, I understand the argument where they go, well, what, we don't need Calvin because we've got, you know, Gruev. Kamara, Ampadu and stuff like that. But similarly, we had good players in the Championship that when we went up to the Premier League, they weren't good enough. Like I know when I watched Mateus click in the Premier League, I wasn't feeling it personally. So we we can't just assume that if, you know, Calvin came back, he wouldn't get into that starting eleven. He's still a fantastic player. I don't think it will happen though. Uh, I, I just wanted to do well on like, a, on like a personal level. I just want him to do well. And if that's back at Leeds, then yeah, but I just don't see it happening. I really don't. And we just need to move on and, and focus on different targets, I think, that will actually fit more to the team. I think if you want Calvin Phillips back, this is me including as well, you want it back for nostalgia's sake, what he done under Marcelo Bielsa. I don't know if you want him back based on form of late because we all know that hasn't been hasn't been very good at all. Yeah. Um I guess, I guess my sort of perspective with it is, is just always been the same. You know, he's he's, tw he's going to be twenty nine next year. Um, uh, yeah, I, I guess if we can get him on a loan, a a, a ridiculously discounted loan, um, which isn't going to compromise our financial situation because City will not be um, sort of negotiating with any club that they're not going to get some sort of financial reward from. If Leeds want to sell and they just want to buy him outright, that is going to cost Leeds a lot of money. It will, because City go close to the wire in getting back almost what they've spent. So it probably be about 25, 30 million. Is it worth it for a player who's injury prone um, and who looks like he's on a little bit of a downturn at the minute? Um, I feel there's a lot of damaged goods there, a hell of a lot of damaged goods when it comes to the negotiation and potentially the player as well. I think we put a cap on it. He was a Bielsa player, a Bielsa product. Many of that side were. And Bielsa was able to get something out of that kid that nobody else will, will be able to get out of him ever again in his career, in my personal opinion, with the age that he's at right now and, and what he's gone through at City and what he's currently going through at West Ham. I, I don't see an upside to that. I think there will be better targets out there, younger targets out there. And, you know, even if we're just looking at the, a lot of people compare him and Ampadu. You know, Ampadu's 22 years of age and he's now worked under Daniel Farker for, for a full season. You can see a high ceiling for 
for Ampadu. Let's let's work with that instead. I mean, that's how I see it, to be honest, Oscar. Where, where do you stand on it? Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think um, there's still quality there. I think there's still... The, the, the player you're seeing at West Ham right now isn't the Calvin Phillips we know or we've seen. You know, he's a better player than what he's shown at West Ham. And I think it was a poor move for him, to be honest, West Ham. You know, logically, looking at the way they play, it's I don't think it's really suiting Calvin Phillips that. But nevertheless... He has to do better himself there. There's no question about that. You look at where, would it, where, where would have been a good move for him then? I genuinely think abroad would have been good. You know, I think Italy or Spain. I think so a decent team in Italy or Spain, you know, in terms of maybe top five, top six, I think would have worked quite well for him. You know, he's playing in a team that might even be playing a little bit of European football as well. I think I felt a better move. I just think West Ham, you're not seeing a lot of the ball. The weaker parts of Calvin's game, I think are getting a little bit more highlighted in that West Ham team. And it's West Ham team in horrible form as well. I just never really felt that move for West, for Calvin, to be honest. But in terms of injuries, it's not just this season. It's not just the season before. It's last season at Leeds. He didn't play a lot of football. Yeah, you know, of course. He put in a majestic performance to keep us in the division when he kept Christian Eriksen out in, on that final game of the season. And one of his best games for us. But that really does paint a different picture to what that actual season was. You know, that like mm. last season for Calvin, it wasn't the same. Um, not so much for performances on the pitch, but in terms of availability, he just wasn't available enough. And that kind of momentum's carried on. Um, you know, pretty much since Euro 2021, to be honest, in terms of you know, having to play you know, a lot of football prior to that. And since that, he just hasn't had the fa- same level of availability, really. Oscar, Oscar, Oscar as well. That that I mean tight that that entire tournament where we're talking about player of the mm. tournament, that's 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 nearly four years ago exactly. now. Exactly. It's a yeah. long it, time ago. Yeah. yeah, there's no question about that. You know, he isn't yeah, I think he's still a very good player, but he's not the player I think he was under Bielsa. You know, I think under Bielsa, you're talking a 25, 26 year old at his physical peak at that point who could do anything. You know, he's playing as a six in one of the most attack minded teams in the whole division, in the whole of England, having to cover so much space, and he excelled at it. Can Calvin still carry out a role like that? I don't think he can. No. And then obviously there's a cost factor in it as well. It's not going to be a cheap deal mm. to get done. Um, if it is a loan, you know, the prob- probably the cheapest way of doing it is a loan then we're under pressure to play Calvin, no matter what. I don't want to be in that situation with any player. You know, we've seen that before, you know, in terms of the big investments in Brendan Aronson, the big investments in, um, you know, say Mark Rocker, you know, people like that, you know, in terms of you know, maybe not so much Mark Rocker, actually Diego Rente, you know, players like that, where we invested sort of 20, 25 million and almost felt the pressure to start them, even though we kind of knew they weren't good enough. I don't want to be in that situation with Calvin. I'm not saying... He's that level. He's obviously a much better player than them, but we don't want to be in a situation where we're having it dictated to clubs like Man City that, right, he's got to play X amount of minutes. We just don't want that situation next season. And then the other factor as well is Ethan Ampadu. You've kind of alluded to it already, Connor. He's younger. At this moment in time, he's playing better than Calvin. I think ultimately he's more suited to this system. Yeah, when you look at this Leeds team, if we get promoted, we're going to have to do a lot of work, work in the transfer market. There's no question about it. Not just in terms of the starting eleven. I think less so the starting eleven, more so depth. Mm. You don't want to be making investments in areas that you don't desperately need. We don't desperately need a Calvin Phillips at this moment in time because we have Ethan Ampadu. You can't sign Ethan Am- uh, You can't sign Calvin Phillips and say, right, you're back up to to Ethan Ampadu. It just makes no sense. He's not that type of player. He's not going to be a player. If we're signing Calvin Phillips, he's got to go in and be guaranteed starts. Ampadu and Phillips as a midfield two, I don't really feel it. I think. I think it's got to be one or the other. And for me, that choice is Ethan Ampadu. I see the logic behind it, looking at Calvin Phillips. You know, you look at some people like Ross Barkley at Luton. Suddenly, you know, obviously after some horrendous form, he's found the club that suited him. And that might be part of the hope of a Calvin Phillips. But I don't think it's a risk we need to take so much, to be honest. I just don't really see it as a move that makes much sense all in all. And for me... All the one to see is Calvin Phillips just get a move that works for him now. You know, on the on the personal level, I'm saying with Ollie, you know, in terms of it is sad seeing this kind of decline in Calvin Phillips. You know, I don't think anyone is enjoying this at all. Um, and yeah, it's just been a disaster for all parties, really. You know, in terms of yeah, last season we had a massive hole in our midfield. Man City didn't get rid. I just don't understand why Man City needed to do that transfer. You yeah, know, in terms of. But- Oscar, so this is my point about all this, and I, I would love to springboard well, did here. Did Pep sell him a dream that was never there? That, no, that's, that's the no, no. Any, any top team in any top league 
gives you the potential to compete. But here's the truth about Calvin Phillips over the last number of seasons. Now he has battled injuries for sure in that, but Calvin Phillips is walking around about a stone heavier than he did when he was at his best under Marcelo Bielsa. That's indisputable. When you look at the a performance he's putting in, the heat map and the distance a covered, it's heavier. not even close. About a stone heavier. and A stone, a stone heavier? Yeah, yes. Yeah, well, when he was playing for Marcelo Bielsa. There's no, way to, there's, no, there's no way to put on a stone with Pat. No way. That seems no, it's, like it's not about... No, it's hang stone. on. L- l- let, me, let me talk about what I'm talking about here. Look at him now. It's, it's not about... Pep made a number of illusions... It wasn't just about, I, I know the, the weight comment went viral and stuff like that, but there were also, I, you know, there's some good journalism done about this. He was offered an opportunity to come back and train early, um, early and he didn't take it. There are loads of players that ride the bench season after season. Ross Barkley is a great example of this, right? Who keep their personal levels of fitness high. Calvin Phillips hasn't done that. Look at um, just, and I know West Ham plays differently. But look at, if you watch the games, the effort and endeavor that I used to see under Marcelo Bielsa isn't there. The distance covered isn't there. The heat map in terms of of where he's taking up his positions, where he's, like the challenges. I I mean, one of the things we loved about Calvin Phillips is he's a monster without the ball. That's not there either. There are players that when they get big moves, they fundamentally change. As a player, I'm not saying as a guy. I'm sure he's, he's, everybody says he's wonderful. That's not the, I'm not casting any aspersions on him in that sense. But you have to at some point look at yourself and say, right, am I the player I was under Marcelo Bielsa? The answer is categorically no. I test the data, it all shows up. Now, you, when you're not as in shape, you pick up injuries easier. When you're not as in shape, you can't do some of the stuff. The, the, the things that made him get signed by Pep Guardiola, he showed up at Man City unable to do those things at that clip. And in my estimation, just from the outside looking in, outside of any of the sentimentality, I don't think he ever took his craft as seriously as some of the other guys there. I don't think he ever did gave Pep reasons to really say, all right, does Calvin Phillips deserve more time? It got so bad that, uh, that Pep was calling up players from center half to play in that holding midfield position instead of Calvin Phillips. So, and now watching his performances at West Ham. Now he's been unlucky, uh, especially with that penalty. I mean, that was not penalty uh, uh, playing against Everton the other day. So I think in some ways he's being dug, dug out. But when you look at, just look, watch the games. He's jogging, letting players run past him. It's just not there mentally for him anymore. He talked about losing his drive when he was at Man City, and there are just different types of players. You can have players that get a big move. They're on a massive wave. They've done. They've won trophies, whether they played an active uh, um, part of it or not. Do you want to take the step down? Do you want to be the fittest person on the field anymore? I don't think he does. I, I would think, yeah, love I, Calvin I, Phillips back the way he was under Bielsa, just in terms of his levels of fitness, his level of endeavor. Nobody tried harder than Calvin Phillips. He made himself with uh, Marcel Bielsa into an excellent player that was getting calls, calls up for England. That guy is not the player we see for West Ham. If any of our lone players last season put in performances like he has for West Ham and then flipped off fans that were giving him abuse, we would never accept it. And neither are our West Ham fans. I'm not saying the right to abuse him, by the way. That's disgraceful. But I'm just, I'm simply saying we would never have accepted that. West Ham fans aren't accepting it. The guy that Calvin Phillips is right now is not a player I'd want at Leeds. I would love for him to find his form again, to work himself back. His level of fitness is absurd. It's unacceptable right now for a professional footballer. We, I think it's easy to call out and see. But what I'd say is, I, I don't think it's so much... Calvin Phillips has just decided he's got to Man City. I'm not saying this is what you're saying in terms of Calvin Phillips has just decided, right, I've got to Man City, I've made it. I, I don't, I just think it's his body is not allowing him to do the things he used to do. I think you see, yeah, but part of it is training, body. Oscar. I mean, like, do you really yeah, let your, your training Calvin's levels drop off like that? Yeah, I mean, he's the one who's let himself gain. It's not just about the weight, it's about it. Sometimes weight isn't that important for certain player profiles, but for a guy that covers all the ground on the pitch and is everywhere and then is known for pinging really accurate long balls um, and having a, a dynamic range of passing, but primarily the defensive graft he puts in so other players don't have to do that. 
it's really important to maintain that high level of fitness. He hasn't. I think I'm not saying it's because he feels like I've arrived, but there is something that happens to you professionally when you get on a certain level of money if your mentality isn't elite. And I don't think there's, we, we've been given no reason to believe that the player we're seeing. I, just watch the West Ham matches. If anybody can tell me they think that that's Calvin Phillips out there and it doesn't look like somebody masquerading with his skin on, then put your hand up. But he so doesn't Gabe, play anything so Gabe, like Calvin want, Phillips used to. So, so Gabe, you want, him, is, you, want, you want him back then, Gabe? I would love to have Calvin Phillips restore, take a hard look in the mirror and be like, you know what? I've got to do an off season of intense training. I need to make myself undroppable wherever I am. I would love him to have great performances in West Ham, uh, for West Ham and see the player. If, if we got that guy back, I would take that. But we're not going to yeah. get it. Oscar, He's not Oscar. coming back. Can I just um, emphasize, though, as much as I've kind of said, you know, and says I'm sad for Calvin and says what's happened, I don't feel sorry for Calvin at the same time. No. You know, he took a move that he shouldn't have took. Yeah, I think anyone could have told him, Rodri, you're not taking Rodri out of the team. Unless Pep said to him, right, we might play with two defensive midfielders or we might rotate and things like that and, you know, didn't overpromise, then, yeah, fair enough. He, he's kind of been sold a dream that wasn't there kind of thing. But... For me, you look at it logically and think, was that the right move at the right time for Calvin? No, it wasn't. And it was kind of predictable how it kind of played out. It was similar in a sense to, say, Jack Rodwell, you know, in terms of when he went to Man City suddenly and took the move too quickly. Mm. I don't know if it's so much he took the move too quickly, but you're looking at maybe Liverpool with Fabinho kind of on his last legs in terms of physically. I think that would have been a better move at the time. I can't lie to you. I think that would be a far better move. I think a I think, I, I, think, I think as well. I think as well to add to that as well, Oscar, it'd have it'd have um, sort of accentuated some of his attributes that were great at Leeds. I think the Pep system yeah. changes players and, and exactly. for the best, for the better. But it does it does. I mean, we see it with Jeremy Doku. We see it with Jack Grealish. They are restrained on what they can do, and it's and Calvin's and, the same. Yeah, we no, just playing the yeah. long passes over the yeah. top. You know, to you know, get on the transition or get on the counter attack. Pep doesn't want that. Pep wants no, you know doesn't. short, sharp five, five, ten yarders. That's never really been Calvin's game. You know, his game has been Calvin became a great player at Leeds when he found that passing range. When Marcelo Bielsa thought, right, we'll play him deeper because let's remember the first two or three years of Calvin, he was box to box and he was inconsistent in that role. Bielsa found that role for him deeper as a six, spraying the ball long and just dictating the play. From deep in that kind of sense, that isn't really what Pep wanted. He wanted a metronome. We're going to use that word again, like a Rodri, number four, a Gundogan, you know, someone who can just play pass after pass after pass, and and that's why you're seeing you like the Grealish and Doku not make the impact that these players, you know, Grealish, Doku, Phillips, you know, they're not the players they were at other clubs, but they haven't suddenly become bad players. It's just they don't suit the system they kind of they've gone into, and that's the case um... Aaron Phillips. Should we, should we put should we put a cap on Mr. Non League United player Calvin Phillips? But yeah, it was a I nice think we all agree we want him back. Yeah. So that's the, uh, that's the thing. There. I'm just saying he well, goes from walking around at 159 or under Bielsa. He looks like an 175 pound player now to me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> just, just imagine you just been like a, a UFC fighter, just like uh, just UFC qualifying fight. for a fight. Wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're weighed in twenty pounds heavier. See you later. <laughs> There's no way he was stone heavier though. There's no. Oh, let's way not start there. He was 159 oh. at Leeds. He's in the 170s at West Ham. Yes, that's what about a stone saying? heavier. Not a stone heavier. Okay. That's <laughs> that's fine. We did the test. A, we did if you the say test it's after. not, then it can't be. But yeah, he's walking around in the 170s. He's 159. That is mad, though. If, it, if that is the case, fair play. But it's been f- about. It's been three years. Like you know, you gain four pounds here. I do. Listen, this happens to me every year. I've gained about two stone just in the winter. Oh, you're, going, you're going through his dietary requirements. Right? <laughs> gain four pounds, nothing over. <laughs> <laughs> um, Steve said just ordered two items for your merch brilliant job Connor look amazing yeah you can check that in the description below everybody don't buy that cheap tat that Oscar's got on just go get some good quality stuff <laughs> joking mate I've even got your your favourite player on here mate Georgie, there Georgie you go. There you go. Um, okay let's get on to Coventry briefly um, must win game um, yeah. must win game all what are your thoughts on that yeah I think it's going to be a lot harder than than people think. Coventry aren't a pushover team. Every team, pretty much, apart from maybe a few in the middle and Rotherham, uh, are all fighting for something. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, it's we're all worried about Ipswich Norwich and stuff. I think we need to focus on our own game. I think Coventry, 
is a difficult game. But yeah, all the these last six, I genuinely believe we need five or six wins to even be in the question for top two because I don't see Leicester or Ipswich. I, I, I feel like every Leicester, Ipswich and Leeds are just going to mirror results. I feel like if Ipswich win, Leeds will go win and, and we have to do that because if, if I'm being honest and this is a bit of a, I, I can maybe see us being the, the third which is horrible at the moment because I, I don't know because that that game in hand from Leicester is a bit annoying as well. So I don't know. I, I don't know. But yeah, all these games are must wins, but it's going to be a difficult one. Well, interesting there, Ollie, because I've I've sort of said something similar every now and again. I've said I think Leeds will go up, but I'm sort of hoping that worst case scenario we can we can get rid of that hoodoo and um, actually go up through the playoffs. That'd be nice. I think Leeds would still be the best team in the playoffs. To be honest with you, looking at it right now, so even if we were to finish third, it's not game over. Um, but yeah, uh, Oscar, what are your thoughts? It's one of those, <laughs> isn't it? I think it really is. It's a flip of a coin at this moment in time. I do have that horrible feeling with Ips, which you've already alluded to it, you know, in terms of being relentless. But Leicester, there's still something there for me where Leicester, I think, I don't know. I think last yesterday, the nerves started to tell it 1 0 down. You know, fair play to them. They came back into it. But that crowd was not happy. Even at 0 0, that crowd was nervy kind of thing. And I think that kind of energy, and you can say it with Leeds as well, you know, in terms of nervous energy, you know, when you, we know. Leeds and Leicester, the expectation levels naturally are far, far higher than Ipswich, and that will obviously lead to you know differences in expectation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and momentum and all things like that. But I do think it could tell with, with Leicester a little bit. I think you've seen with Mareska this season, he has made some very range decisions when Leicester have kind of been you know Chowsbury to right back, you know things like that. You know it it just totally backfired. You know in terms of Mameti getting the winner from the left hand side, so. I do still think top two's on. I do think one of Ipswich and Leicester, I don't, we say it, we said it for weeks and weeks and weeks. They can't win every game. Uh, <laughs> they well. can, but they well, can't Leicester win have been game. losing, haven't they? Like, you know, the, they... Um, I think surely one of them's got to drop points. They can't both win six out of six or seven out of seven in, in Leicester's case. So we will get opportunities. This weekend's massive though. You know, the fact we go to Coventry, Ipswich goes to Norwich. Two really horrible aways. Yeah, you know, listen, Coventry are a team. I really like Coventry. I can't lie. In mm. terms of from a neutral point of view, what they do in terms of recruitment, they are a really likable team. They play superb football. Yep. Um, and they've got players that can hurt us. There's no question about it. I was impressed with them at Ellen Road, to be honest. They are a very threatening team. And especially the fact they come off into this game off the back of a poor defeat to Cardiff. Very tough game. And I think really. Whoever gets the better out of the Coventry, Leeds and Norwich, Ipswich games, that's going to be massive for momentum for the next five after that. You know, if we can get that win at Coventry, Ipswich drop points, massive. Ipswich win, we drop points, massive. You know, it's, it is so similar to the Leeds Sheffield United 2019. It really is. It, it really is who blinks first kind of thing. And it is going to go to the last game of the season, though. I'm convinced of that. I'm very much convinced that I just can't see how any of the three really pull away from each other enough to for it not to go to the end of the season in some kind of way. Um, yeah, and obviously Samson still have a big say in this promotion race. He's still got mm-hmm. us and Leicester to play. All of a sudden, looking at Samson yesterday, oh, that's not... If we go into that last game of the season needing to win, mm. and we're not... Um, Samson will dominate the ball against us. Nothing against us as a team. Samson will dominate the ball. You're thinking, oh, giving up 70% of the ball in a game we need to win at home doesn't feel yeah, very I've, nice. I've, 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 been, I've been convincing myself that it'll That's be done. That's not going to be a nice sort of game type then. of game to have. You know, you're thinking yeah. that whole game magnified by two, last game of the season as well. Oh, that is not really what you want, but that's the reality we face at this moment in time. The reality, Whatever predictions we give, it won't come true. That's the way the season's been. It is. It's the way the season's been. Yeah. When we thought Ipswich have gone, they haven't. When we thought Sampson had gone, they haven't. When we thought ourselves had gone, they haven't. Mm. Leicester come back with a massive win against Norwich as well. And not just the win, it was quite a... It was probably their best performance of the season, to be honest, I thought, in the second half from Leicester. I thought they were at... We've been critical of Leicester's play style all season. 
they were absolutely unplayable in that second half. Mavi Didi, my word, what a performance that was in the second bit of the game. You know, if it if that had been Somerville, you know, quite rightly so, would have been absolutely singing his praises. Mavi Didi, Jewsbury Hall. They've. I knew you were going to say Jewsbury Hall. It's your favorite guy's name to say. Well, Jewsbury Hall. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he's relentless, isn't he? He's, he's just. No, I th- you know, Oscar. I think. I think you're right. I think one thing. I've said is that I do think it's going to come down to that last match against sub- Southampton, uh, ultimately to decide what happens with us. I think th- the silver lining here in terms of what I see in Leicester's performance is if you just look at their last five, I mean, they've lost a QPR. They have barely squeaked past a woeful Sunderland team. Uh, they drew with Hull who we've see- seen are a good team, even though we were able to get result Bristol city have beaten them. And then they've be- um, beaten Norwich. They have, their next two matches, I'm hope, hoping, because they'll probably win these, that they get, or actually three, they'll get lulled into a false sense of security because they've got Birmingham, Millwall, and Plymouth. <laughs> but then they have West Brom in Southampton. Um, and those are going to be their most difficult matches of the season, I think. Look, we don't have a fixture left that I don't think we should win. Um, we're not going to win all of them, but we're we're unbeaten since, is it January? Is that the last time we've been beaten? This calendar, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So just don't lose. You know what I mean? Like win the matches. As Ollie said earlier, I don't care if we have to kick, bite, scream. I don't care what we have to do to get all three points. Uh, But if we win the matches we have at home and we don't lose, I expect that we should uh, that we should be in a top two position. And I do think that there's some drop off left for Leicester because their performances have been weird. Yeah, maybe that uh, they find a run of form again. The only concern I have is just given the injuries we have, you think that at some point we're due for a loss, right? So I hope that doesn't happen. And uh, I have a lot of confidence in the way Farka has managed this team thus far. Hopefully some of these injuries aren't too bad. I'm not sure what, what Gruev's status is or what Connor Roberts' status is, uh, but I'd feel much better about a Gruev in Archie Gray midfield or a Gruev and Kamara midfield with Archie Gray back at the right back position. I have no doubts about that Ampadu center half with, with Rodon, of course, the, the injuries. For me, I think we're the most talented team in the division. I do. I think that we have the best coach in the division for this level, and uh, that should win out. Of course, it would be nice if whatever which is spell Ipswich cast wore off because uh, it's starting to get old. <laughs> winning in the last not like five minutes in teams that against teams they have thoroughly outplayed them it's remarkable it's great yep. Drama. yep it is great drama indeed uh, guys there's been an hour and 20 of uh of content for you there we're gonna leave it there it's been an absolute pleasure um and uh, yeah make sure you like comment and subscribe check out the merch link in the description below uh, check out the patreon as well you can move a youtube member as you've seen in the chat two quid a month um and as well everybody make sure you check out mr ollie ward's youtube channel it's been an absolute pleasure and uh we will see you on the other side cheers <laughs>